Hey everyone, welcome to a special bonus episode of The Theater Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Seals, and this is the recording of the live panel that happened at BroadwayCon 2023 just a few weeks ago as I'm recording this intro now. It's with the women of the cottage, Dana Steingold, Laura Bell Bundy, Lily Cooper, and playwright Sandy Rustin. Just a heads up, there was a little snafu with the beginning of the recording. So the actual intro that I read live was cut off. I'm going to redo it now, and then we're going to dive straight into the answer from Sandy, which is her response to my question, why even write this thing in the first place? So here's the intro. Today we're all here to talk with these amazing women about the new soon-to-be Broadway smash hit, The Cottage. Set in the English countryside in 1923, this tale of sex, betrayal, and love unfolds when Sylvia, played by Laura Bell Bundy, decides to expose her affair to both her husband and her lover's wife. The true meaning of fate, identity, and marriage are called into question as a surprising and hilarious web of secrets unravels in this ridiculous, potentially murderous, romantic comedy. So Sandy, why even write this thing? While they're great female characters in those plays, often those female characters are there in service to the male characters. And that the plot lines in those plays are often very male story centric. And so I wondered what would happen if I tried to flip that on its head and create a show in that same world where the female characters had something to say. And so that's how The Cottage was born. And I'm from Chicago. I just really yes. like it. <laughs> and Sandy, Sandy is an actress and award-winning playwright recently named American Theater Magazine by, by the magazine as one of the most produced playwrights of the 22-23 season. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And her stage adaptation of the film Clue is one of the most produced plays in the U.S. now with 3,000 productions. 3,000, really? Worldwide? That's incredible. Oh, oh, incredible. Good Lord, <laughs> Thanks, indeed. you guys. A lot of people. So, uh, uh, why take on this particular type of story? And I want you to also get into the 10 years in the making sure. aspect of this as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wrote it because I wanted a challenge. I loved this genre. Clue and was I, too easy? <laughs> no, no, I wrote Cottage way before I wrote Clue. Really? Yeah, uh -oh. I wrote The Cottage in 2013, and I've been developing it over the last 10 years. The Cottage first, uh, uh, the Clue first premiered in 2020. Um, January of 2020, right before mm -hmm. the pandemic. So yeah, I had written The Cottage almost seven full years before Clue. And okay, so there, there's obviously things with Broadway that, uh, or off Broadway, or um, wait, where, where did this first start? Like in the basement of, yeah, of a church in Queens? That's right, it was uh, the Astoria Performing Arts Center and their performance space was in the basement of a church in Queens. And the budget for the set for that production was $1,000. And I thought it was the most gorgeous set I had ever seen. The uh, set designer was this man named Stephen Dobey, and he cut out cardboard boxes into pieces to create a thatched roof that he like, I don't know, paper mache or something, uh, and it was and painted it, and it was stunning, gorgeous. And I thought it could never get better than this. <laughs> and now we have, um, you know, resources to Paul Tate Depu has done the set for our Broadway, Broadway debut for him. Yep. Broadway debut. He's incredible. And the set itself gets applause. When I was about to say, yeah. literally, it gets its own entrance applause. Yeah. The curtain goes up. The set gets its own entrance applause because it's it's become this whole character in the thing. And uh, so, Laura Bell, I actually want to start with you. Um, uh, Tony nominee, Laura Bell, made her stage debut. Laura, Be Laura Bell Bundy, you have a last name, I'm sorry. Yes, that's okay. um, made her stage debut at age nine in the Christmas Spectacular at Radio City Music Hall. Originated the roles of Tina in Ruthless, Amber in Hairspray, and of course Elle Woods in Legally Blonde, the musical. And she's been Glinda on Broadway, and we have an alphabet down there too, so maybe, you know. Um, Laura Bell, uh, you, I, I've known you for a couple of years, and your whole, your, what you focus in, to, focus in on is strong female empowerment and and like really representing i think who you are real deep down at the core so like when you i guess how did you get a, a, attached to this and what about this role really speaks to you as somebody who's trying to rewrite her story um well uh i was approached um uh, it'll be what 11 months ago ish 10 11 months ago um I, I was sent this play and I 
laughed on page one, which I thought was a pr out loud, which I thought was a pretty good sign that normally doesn't happen. And I laughed continuously throughout. And the, um, the icing on the cake was that this character of Sylvia was, uh, had such a beautiful arc in terms of where she starts, um, you know, full of uh, this sort of lost in the bliss of love, um, in this unawareness of, of herself in a way, and then sort of goes through these different stages of jiltedness and bitterness and anger and then the hope and possibility of love again into finding that actually uh, what she's looking for is inside of herself. And so I loved that message in general for a woman um, that as an actor is such a fun and juicy thing to play. Um, and of course, since it, it's important to me to uh, play strong female characters or that plays do have those things. The focus is really about the women in this play, um, not only in, in Sylvia's transformation, but in also her relationship with the other women throughout that she could have conflict with, but she finds common ground and bond with, which I thought was so beautiful and you've done such a great job of that. Um, but the, the overall message of this is that, you know, and I don't want to give too much away, but, um, you know, often as women, we identify ourselves as belonging to something else when we explain who we are. I'm a mother, or I'm a wife, or I'm a this, I'm a that. And I think we see sort of Sylvia transform to being her own. And I think that's a message that, that resonated in 1923, and I think it resonates in 2023. So, uh, Yes, it, mostly this is a fun, outrageous <laughs> comedy. But there is a nice little message mm -hmm. at the end that um, we can be autonomous as women and, you know, we can also be sexy beasts as well. <laughs> so that's, so it appealed to me on, and the cherry on top was the feminist message. The icing on the cake was the character. The play is the cake. And uh, it, I'm having a, a blast doing this play. I feel so grateful to have this juicy ass role and to be working with these brilliant women and this cast. We have a great time. We do. We do. Almost too much, too much Maybe too much fun. <laughs> Dangerous. <laughs> you lost me with the cake metaphor, but I think I'm. Um, I'm it's sorry. fine. You can um, go back and listen to it later. So yeah, I'll, I'll, re I'll rewind it. Um, Lil, Lil Coops. Yeah. Lily Coops, Tony nominee for her role in POTUS. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Julian Tootsie. Sorry, my notes are wrong. Julian Tootsie. That was, a, and then she was Chris in POTUS. Out of order. Sandy Cheeks in SpongeBob, original cast of Spring Awakening, and of course, Elphaba in Wicked. Um, oh my God. Your role, uh, <laughs> the way you approached your character, you come in, and I, I also love um, that your character, I'm not giving too much away, your character is pregnant. Mm -hmm. And uh, it becomes this running gag of the, of the whole thing along with the set, which is, I want to, we're going to come back to the set because I love the set and I love everything about it. Um, but for you, Lily, like when you're choosing your roles, kind of the same sort of thing, mm -hmm. when you're trying to uh, put yourself into, into making history and originating a role like mm -hmm. this, what attracts you about it? And are you looking for that comedy? Are you looking for something else? I mean, I, I love doing comedies and I feel so lucky that in the past two years I've been able to do a, a, a summer farce. And uh, if I could make that the rest of my career, I would <laughs> do a farce every July. And um, <laughs> I, I, since having a child, since becoming a mother, I truly believe that I have been drawn to these maternal roles. The last show I did, I was a nursing mom. This show, I'm a pregnant mom, and who knows what'll be next. Uh, but I am fully drawn to it. And funny little story is I actually got an appointment to audition for a, a different role for, uh, for Deirdre in the show, the role that Dana plays. And I read it and thought it was hilarious, and I just knew I wasn't quite right for it. But reading the role of Marjorie, I was like, that's me. And definitely the maternal aspect of her, the kind of you know, 
sassy, judgmental aspect of her. <laughs> I was like, yep, spot on. Mm -hmm, that's me. So uh, that's really what drew me to her. I love that. And uh, certainly, uh, not least, uh, last to be introduced, Dana Steingold. All right. Last seen on Broadway, originating the role of Girl Scout in Beetlejuice, who we also have Girl Scout right here in the front yeah. row. And uh, she also covered Lydia Dietz. It, has anybody seen The Cottage yet? Yes? Okay, so round of applause for frickin' Dana Steingold. Yes. I, I, I mean, all, all three of you. Okay, I'm stopping. <laughs> Dana, you have impressed me so much in this show. Because, oh, thank you. like, you're breaking the mold of what we, I think all of us can or have expected uh, of you and your personality and what you're presenting on stage. And you come to this with a freshness and a, an intelligent naivete that I don't think anybody else could pull off. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's probably like 25 at least other people who can pull it off. <laughs> nah. No, nah. no, no, nope. no. And um, so, by the way, uh, a one-on-one -on -one episode with Dana is soon to be released on the podcast feed. But so we talked about this a little bit, but for the room here, um, for you, uh, how did you get attached, and what is it about you that sort of um, allowed you just because this is slapstick at some points? Like for you, you are literally. If you could tell your audition story, doing the self tape. Oh. With the, <laughs> yes. With so the line. you know, since 2020, many of us have been putting auditions on tape, and I think that sort of stuck around a bit. Uh, and so a lot of first round auditions before like a final callback will simply be on tape. And so um, everybody, these amazing women were already sort of in place. And I think uh, Sandy can probably speak to this a bit more than I can truthfully, but I think they were having a bit of trouble finding like the right uh, fit for this particular production. And uh, I was sort of, my agents said, can you read this script? We wanna sort of push you for this, but we want to make sure you feel comfortable with it before, you know, that you feel good about it before we uh, submit you and all of that. And they sent me the script. I was out of town working and I read it and I said, I love it. I think it's really exactly what I'd want to follow up Beetlejuice with, but um, I cannot make this tape by tomorrow. I need like one extra day because I'm in Florida <laughs> doing a concert and I said, I just need one more day. So I came home and um, Alan and I spoke about this, but I had to make a tape. And when you see the show, there are many things that happen. There are like guns and <laughs> do you get, one of the requirements of the audition was like, could you get progressively drunk uh, <laughs> and like show yourself doing so on a tape um, while simultaneously falling to the floor and or like down a chair. So I, <laughs> and I, I ended up doing the- I wanna see this audition. Me too. I'll show it to you. The tape is wild. My, my husband was my camera person and my reader. So um, I had like a Swiffer as a gun in the first oh! scene. <laughs> And I realized it was too big in the second part of the scene because it was starting to hit the camera. So I switched it to like the dust buster. Like, <laughs> and I, like, I literally sent the tape to my agents and I was like, they're either gonna be like, this girl's so crazy, she should definitely be in our play or this girl's absolutely crazy, we cannot bring her into the play. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, the tapes of me getting drunk are like, I'm rolling over my couch, like frontward. I hit my head on the coffee table at one point. Like it was really something. At one point, I think I spit all the water out of my mouth and like the last take is like, I'm soaking wet. So they're beautiful and flattering. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then uh, they called me and they said, you're gonna come in the room, here's some notes from your tape. And there was sort of a final callback and it was, it all happened very quickly from there. We sort of had like a 20-ish minute work session and then like 24 hours later it was kind of done and then the cast was announced like the, the next yeah week. it was very fast it was very fast mm -hmm. after seeing the production and the the cast is is see all, all the women here and there's three men in it as well um and uh, eric mccormick from will and grace uh is in it as well and hal joshi and alex moffitt from saturday night live so uh, his my God, Sandy, his physical slapstick <laughs> I, and his, his Broadway debut as well. Anyway, so you've got these three amazing people and then it just happens to be directed by Jason Alexander from Seinfeld, um, his Broadway debut for directing. And I guess let's back up a second. So I want to see, I want to number one, what did you think when you saw Dana's audition tape? Yes. And, but then the other thing was, when did you start working with Jason in this 10-year process, and how did you put that together? Yeah, sure. So, well, 
Uh, we had seen many, many, many audition tapes for the role of Deirdre. And when Dana's came in, I was actually working on a, a new play of mine called The Suffragette's Murder at the Denver Center for Performing Arts in their new play summit. And I had been like up round the clock and exhausted. And it was like really, we were like pushing it. We really needed to find a Deirdre. And Dana's tape came in and I replied all to <laughs> however many people were on that thing and said, winner, winner, chicken, hire this woman <laughs> immediately. Um, and to be honest, the same thing happened with Lily. Lily came into an in-person session when we were seeing Deirdre's and she came in as Marjorie, dressed as Marjorie, ready as Marjorie. She walked in, she was Marjorie. She walked out of the room and Jason and I turned to each other and we said to each other simultaneously, she's hired. And that was it, I think she was hired within, like I think she I got, got a call like, like an hour later. Yeah, yeah it was within crazy. an hour. Wow. Um, it was so wonderful. So um, I cannot say enough, I cannot shower these women enough or the men in this play it's with amazing. praise. It has been a total dream come true to work with this group of actors. Um, so Jason and yeah, it's true, you can clap. Please clap um, Jason and I met probably five or six years ago now. He was ready to make his Broadway debut as a director. And he we had at the same agency at the time, him as a director, me as a writer, and he went to them and said, What new comedies do you have? And the cottage had been kicking around regionally for quite some time and had had some nice reviews, and so my play was amongst the comedic plays that they shared with him and he gravitated to this one and I went out to LA and we met and he and I connected with each other. And so we've been, we've been waiting for the moment when this play was going to, you know, come to Broadway together for um, several years. We've done a couple readings of it together over the years. It was supposed to happen right before the pandemic and then of course it didn't. And so now here we are. So that was the journey. So it's it's essentially, and Dana actually said this to me uh, when we were talking. Was it's a sitcom? It's it's a sitcom on stage. <laughs> that's a great. That's yeah. great. Right. Yes. Awesome. Right. And it, because there's there's the center that the audience is looking at, and then there's action that happens off in the wings, and you you do such a great job of establishing this is the kitchen, and this is the upstairs, and that is the study, and then there's the secret. And the, uh, the, I'm not going to spoil it, Joe. Oh, don't a, give me a spoil it. Oh, a little something, something that you got to see. We're going to take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. The original $1,000 version of the set versus what it is now. Which I'd love to see pictures of, yeah, but. Right. It's gorgeous. It's really beautiful. To be honest, the, the, it's, it's very similar. It's, is it really? Yeah. I mean, this version is stunning and resources and beyond gorgeous, gorgeous. But the layout and how the play moves within the space really, you know, has maintained its integrity for the last decade. And did Jason come in and, and bring, um, or I guess what changes did Jason bring in with his sitcom experience, yeah. right? Because literally, as soon as Dana said that, it clicked. I was like, yes, this is, yeah, this yeah. is Jason bringing his TV Jason's experience. influence is all over this, through the script, through the staging, through the production. I mm -hmm. mean, he really had a clear vision of the kind of comedy that he wanted to, to be in this production, and he has executed it beautifully. So, And so for the rest, uh, so LEB, Lily, Dana, for you, the three of you have so much TV and film and everything experience combined with all, all of you, and working with Eric McCormick and Alex Moffat and Nahel Joshi and Jason Alexander. Is this the, the comedy that you three are now finding? Um, what, is, what is coming out of like the, this amorphous amoeba that is your cast yeah, that's versus it. what are you bringing individually? So I'll start with you, I guess, because you, you, you are very physical com comedic wise anyway. I, we all are. Yeah. Um, uh, I think we all kind of came to this like working our butts off individually before we came into the room um, and then offering uh, in, in the rehearsal space as much as we felt that we could and, uh, and, and everybody had ideas. Everybody has added to, you know, group moments. I mean, our head turns, they're, they're Lily 
all the, you know, yeah. she was really like very specific and on it with this gasping in the head turns and nailing it and different ideas. And um, it's, so I feel like right now we, you know, that was in the rehearsal process of people, of all, all of us going, well, could we try this or is this moment this? And then many lengthy discussions about whether or not it was or not. Um, but now that we're in this show that is set, we're all finding new things and new moments with each other or new ways to deliver or new beats and and it's fun to watch everybody doing that and we have to be prepared for it so we are one organism that is making space for discovery um and being aware of what everybody else's timing is i mean now i actually saw yesterday this was the first time I saw both Eric and Nehal kind of mouthing was, other people's it was words. Your line, no way. And 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 I and, and it was I had never seen it before, but I was like, oh yeah, now we know everyone else's line. Yeah, we exactly. First came into it, it was like we knew ours, and this is a wordy play, girl. Yeah, this was one of the harder things the, oh, to memorize, I think. It is, but it's, words. But it oh, is this totally. style. It is this style. Of this like Noel Coward esque style. It is wordy and fast, and that was that has been. And you the, know, the British part of it too, like which right? lines have the oh, or like the yes, well, you know, like remembering which order. They there's a from. melody in yeah. in with, right. with the English accent. There's right. a melody to it, and it, so it's yes. memorizing the words, but also oh. memorizing melody and the and the pace and the rhythm. Yeah. So there's this added element. I will add to um, you know this the amoeba style of the of the comedy that we're doing and the and the cast that has come together in this show. It's so fun to watch the new things that people have discovered, mm -hmm. and it truly is a kind of like machine organism where when one tentacle moves, you know the opposite tentacle has to react, and that's and it feels so organic in that way. We were talking just last night about how oh it's interesting how some nights this joke gets a laugh and this joke doesn't get a laugh. And we realize, okay, I can't really even move while this person is saying this line so that the audience is really focused on that because if I move, then I distract from it. So it's, it's being, it, there's a, there has to be a selflessness in comedy where you allow yourself to uh, blend into the background when you know who needs to be the focus and then that person will allow you to be the focus when you are. It's it's a really interesting um, collaboration, mm -hmm. and that's what I love so much about comedy because it it can't ever be selfish. It can't ever be just about you. It has to be about every other person on stage. And I think the harder thing is actually realizing when it's your turn to just serve exactly to that to the other actors on stage. Um, and I think this is a group that like we're all we all try to be really cognizant of that. Also because we all we laugh a lot at each other. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. maybe professionally break a lot um, <laughs> because we make each other laugh and everyone's finding new things but I also think I don't know what was fun for me about it is I think Deirdre the stakes are what makes her funny because her yeah. stakes are very high um, and then she's just shiny penny distracted by yeah. whatever else is happening she's like squirrel literally squirrel yeah. but I think the biggest discovery I've made, and I think we're all slowly making, is what you said, even through like 12 previews, is just initially we were all like, oh, we'll each have business while all these other people are talking. And then you realize what the cleanest thing is and the best thing you can do is just like, look to that person, look to that person. Yeah. Give yeah. that person focus, right. give that one focus. And you know, even in like a week and a half's time, I think we learned, I learned that very quickly for myself. I was like, okay, I just have to like sit in this chair and like, have big eyes and look at this person. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that because I I even noticed in another part went right after, um, well, I don't want to be more. When I come back a, after Crump, here you are, wouldn't want you to starve. Uh -huh. That, yes, there's a jilted, but my business has to go on internally. Right. It just messes with everything. Right. Right? If I'm making a, any movements at all. Mm -hmm. right. I wanted to say too, you know, I, I tend to write ensemble comedies. That's what, what I gravitate to. I think in part because I have an improv comedy, sketch comedy background, and that's just what I love. But 
Um, the other day, somebody offered me what I think is probably the greatest compliment, which was it felt to them in watching The Cottage like they were watching an ep like a great episode of The Carol Burnett Show. Oh, wow. Which, which was like yeah. my, you know, that's what I grew up with. And I felt like that's what this ensemble has been able to do in such a short amount of time. These six actors came together and they seem like they're six actors who have worked together for seasons and seasons. Um, on the stage and that's so thrilling for an audience to watch like there's something very unique about an ensemble comedy where when you walk out one person says like didn't you love that person and the, the person they're with is like yes but also this person and also you know everybody has favorite moments and that's thrilling so I you know I give full full whatever how, however much gratitude you can give to a cast of six actors that's what I have to I was do. gonna I was gonna point that out that that when you were talking about um Laura Bell, what you were saying, like sometimes you just have to sit and watch uh, to give the other person the, the attention. It's like, there's no straight person in, there's no straight man in this. It, We're like, straight, we have straight like, moments. Yeah. Straight yeah. moments, but yeah. there's no like, there's not the funny, it's not like Abbott and Costello, where, like there's not the funny yeah. one and there's always the straight one. Mm. Well, they're all, they're all funny and they're all straight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, It just depends on what the moment is. And I think that's what Dana was talking about is figuring out when you're the straight man and when you are the funny man yes. or woman. Mm -hmm. And um, that has been the task of these actors to discover. And, and I think they're discovering it still in front of the audience mm -hmm. of when that ebb and flow happens. And it's really exciting to watch. Yes. And it can ha sometimes we have audiences that laugh at the setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And so the punchline doesn't hit as hard, but we just kind of go, okay, well, they laughed at the setup. So yeah. we just, now we move on. And, you know, so you just don't know sometimes the, the audience is the seventh cast member of this show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or Surrey. So. And yeah. also to Sandy's credit, I know nobody here or anyone listening has seen the script, but what she has written is also highly specific for us also, which gave, I think, is sort of like the launch pad for so mm. many ideas that everyone brought into the room because your stage directions are so specific as well. So that brings a certain clarity that can be both stressful and exciting because you <laughs> want to honor everything, but it's like to your credit because so much is on the page for you, yes. which is not always, I will say. Yes, it was That's nice, thanks. It was good to be able to study it before the first day of rehearsal to know where well, at least yeah. the 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 goalposts, the yellow brick yeah. road. Yeah. Right. There were stage directions in the like in the actual script before you even get to start doing your blocking. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, some moments don't work unless we're in specific places or we're in groups. And I think too, when you're writing a show like, at least for me, when I tend to write physical comedy, and so for me the physicality is married to the dialogue. Mm -hmm. So you can't really write it unless you also say like, while you're saying this, you also are falling down. <laughs> those, <laughs> those two things have to happen at right. the same time. If they don't, nothing's funny. Right. Um, and so I try to make space in the script for lots of other choices to be made and just highlight where the physicality must be married to the dialogue. And then they paid great attention. <laughs> so that was good. So for those keeping track, the show opens tomorrow mm -hmm. as we are recording. Today is the 23rd of, sun, of Sunday, the June, uh, <laughs> July, and it opens tomorrow, the 24th. So um, when did the show, well, I saw it two Thursdays ago, so it was, so I guess we're in the middle of previews. And I think that was the first night where the Michael Michelangelo statue was yeah. used. Uh, the first <laughs> night. You saw it oh, wow. July 13th. That yeah. was our great day. Oh, was it? <laughs> <laughs> A day that will go down in history. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh my God. Um, this, the gags of the sets are incredible. That one's... Yay for Michelangelo statue, everyone. Yeah. Same again. Okay. Yes. Um, well, was, that oh. should get the last bow. That yeah, yeah. You need you need the Michelangelo in the bow. Well, <laughs> no. we'll try to get that in. If, if if Alex still makes a meal out of it like he did when I saw it, then he's got to. Oh, if it's a meal, it does have a reach. What? Yeah. I got, okay, I'm, you got to come back. Okay. You got to come back to see so where he goes. I will come back. back. Um, so the point of bringing it up is that uh, during previews, you're still changing, you're still rewriting, you're still adding and cutting and doing and finding your moments, right? So I guess for for something that's been, we'll call it a 10-year workshop, mm -hmm. more or less, right? You've been doing productions, you've been changing it, and still, even today, you could be changing things because it doesn't lock until tomorrow. So um, for all of you, uh, 
I guess, is it still hard? Or by this point, the day before opening, you found your rhythm, you found your moments. Are you still, like you were saying, you're still discovering some things every now and then, but like even after it's locked, you're not changing lines. Oh, we're going to discover things through October 29th. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Wait, you know, listen, it's technically frozen. Yeah. I believe if there's any wild discovery we have that we wanted to bring to Sandy or Jason that and it worked, that I'm sure there's room to, to make adjustments. But at some point, we got to freeze. Right. You know, <laughs> at some point, we have to also be able to live in the new changes, right? Like, Sometimes when you make a new change, it's not going to nail the first night because you just haven't, you just don't have it in your bones yet. But, uh, but it, it, it keeps getting, I mean, it just keeps getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Yeah. And by discoveries, I mean, I don't necessarily mean like, you know, a, a drastic cross across stage yeah. or a completely new line. It's like we have these specific relationships between each character. And there might be a moment where we clock eyes and we've never clocked eyes before. And all of a sudden we realize, oh, that's a good moment. Yeah. I think <laughs> we're going to keep that, you know. And it's so those kinds of things that may not even read to the audience, but for us just truly you know, uh, grounds us in the reality yes. of who these people are and makes it that much more truthful to us. And that's what I mean by like throughout October 29th, when we close this show, there will be new discoveries made. I'm certain of that. I mean, it's going to get extended. I'm calling it. They're, oh, they're, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, from your lips. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having fun. Um, but, you know, there were things like in this last week that I discovered about this scene with Nahal that I was like, oh, that's what this, been doing this for eight weeks and have, and, and having like a more of like where my character is with it, more just a more of an internal discovery, which, which changed the way that I said some of my lines, which impacted the way that Nahal responded, which got bigger reactions. And it's just these kinds of little teeny tiny, like mini awakenings that we all have, like while we're doing it, you know, that it's so fun. It's and so also, cool it's I like, mean, what? <laughs> I've la I have to like, try not to laugh when, yeah. these, when this cast like, <laughs> comes up with some <laughs> new delivery or head turn or you know just the slight now we're so now we know each other we know each other's stuff so well that we notice the slightest differences yeah. there's one i never will tell you but there's one line that dana has that makes me laugh every time <laughs> i never will tell oh, you i will never <laughs> tell you well then, well you'll be thinking about it when you say yeah. it will mess it up but we but we do i mean we, we giggle at each other we mess up i mean there's so much as we've spoke spoken about like physical and slapstick stuff that like of course things are gonna go wrong, like, um, I mean, we can speak the oh, other, yeah. a few times, but the other night too, like, we, Laura Bell has a, a time where she splashes water in, like, it's sort of like, kind of on my face, but sometimes Alex puts a little too much water in there, <laughs> and I get like, waterboarded. Um, <laughs> and I feel so awful. No, but it's your face right after, because like, she has to, then we get up, and she pulls me up, and we have a slap moment, and like, one thing builds upon the next, and like, her face is always like, <laughs> <laughs> I know because last time it happened, she basically she got like swimmer's ear, you know. I mean, it was like in her ear, and then and then it actually happened yesterday. And then I'm supposed to slap her, and but not like really slap her, but I really slapped her because I was so I was so like surprised at the moment. It was just a mess. And, and then Brand was as I was leaving, he was like, "Can we get um?" I call it he did. and I'm like I just made a mistake it won't happen again I promise I'm not gonna slap him <laughs> uh, but yeah so we're, we're trying those are the things that we're still sort of massaging because yeah. I do spill water on her at one point from the orchestra view I don't have to be near her face to, for it to look like from the balcony view she has to be close I have to be close and almost spilling it on her so I don't know what it looks like because I can't watch our play. Right. <laughs> so I'm just going with whatever I think. And I also have terrible aim. <laughs> As we've I learned. Have horrible hand-eye coordination, which is why I ran track in high school. <laughs> Nothing with balls. <laughs> she said. Pun intended. Pun intended. Um, 
Yeah, come see the cottage. <laughs> <laughs> Lo Pun Lots of balls. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it is. But that's it, also what makes it fun. Yeah. Like, and it, the, think, listen, I, uh, Lily saved me the other day, went up on a line, and, mm -hmm. and ca you came right in, and yeah. the pace kept going. And, you know, we. You look into each other's eyes, and you're like, oh, she's in the white room. Gotta help her. <laughs> <laughs> she's gone. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm here to save the day. And the thing is crazy is that I think I said it. I, <laughs> because a lot of times we're thinking five lines ahead, especially yeah. in previews when sometimes little words are changing and lines are changing. We're thinking I far ahead. Line. Oh. Like I thought I said it. We, I yeah. thought it. I was looking off in the direction. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. We made all of these um, like internal cuts to like a maybe like a seventeen. Yeah, inch oh, or right. Something. And they're all fantastic internal cuts, but they made the mistake of having us read it out loud and not put it in the show that evening. And we all got on stage that night. And hot we all mess. Were like, it was a hot mess. What? What, what do I say? <laughs> Who? Who am this I? This line in the play. Like, <laughs> no one knew. Yeah, that was the first twenty-second gap of <laughs> us going like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I didn't say the line I thought I had said. Dana has a line right after it. And I was like, she's she waiting for me to say my line. I'm looking at her going, why is Why are you saying, saying your line? I said my line. And then, yeah. And, and then, then I, I was sweating. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just said, good Lord, this conversation has gone south. Yeah. Thank God. Thank God I had that line coming up. Yes, anybody who is, you know, we don't want to give anything away, but it is really a, a play that is full of surprises. It is genuinely funny. Um, yeah. yeah. How, how it's like many? like the sexy noises off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sexy noises yeah. off. <laughs> do you, Sandy, do you know, and I don't know the answer. I don't, I maybe only the set crew does. How many cigarettes are yeah. used oh, should, uh, in the play? Find that out. Do you know? I don't know, but that would be a great trivia question. Yeah. Right? So it, I'm going to get the answer. It should be yeah. like, like, a, like a carnival guess the number of marbles in the jar yeah. sort yeah. of thing. It's many. Because it's like three million. Yeah. Um, I smoke five, I think, and I'm nine months pregnant. <laughs> You drink, Wait, hold on. I drink a lot, too. <laughs> hey, it was 1923. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. She's counting. She's counting. Yeah. She's counting. But yeah, there... Uh, I do more than five. Has mm -hmm. it, yeah, every, much like I was saying, the set, the set is... It's another character in the show, and they are interacting with this person, this, this metaphorical person that is the set. Because it is moving, it has gags, it has hidden things all over, yeah. and it, it's, it, it's it is a freaking sitcom, and I, it's one of the most well staged things I've seen in such a long time. That's amazing. Well, that is a testament to all of the people yeah. who are involved. I mean, really, for, well, first about the set, I will say one of the most thrilling things about writing a play is that you have your own imagination, especially when you're writing a physical comedy, of what it needs to look like, where things need to be and how people are going to move through your space. It's part of the writing of it. Then to have a set designer come on board who can visualize it and imagine it beyond your own wildest dreams is so thrilling. It is unbelievably gratifying and exciting to walk in to an imagination of your imagination that's better than your imagination. It's amazing, <laughs> you know. So um, that has been incredible. And what was it, what's so fun is, you know, the idea on the page is there are cigarettes throughout the house in unexpected places in things that have been fashioned to be cigarette holders. And, it, and the script outlines a few ways that we might do that. But it doesn't really offer, sometimes it does, but not everywhere, the specifics of where that might happen or when that might happen. And that's really where a director steps in or where actors come in and say, oh, how about here? How about this? And then it becomes a job of curating. You know, you were asking about changes and mm -hmm. tweaks over these 10 years. I feel like what this, what this rehearsal process for this Broadway production has been for me more than anything is curating ideas. If you put six brilliant comedians and a brilliant comedic director at the helm, there's, there's bound to be more ideas than you, know, than you can ever possibly imagine. And part of the job of the writer in that moment is to try to curate, to rein in, to, to push, to, you know, to say, like, 
here's where I think this might go and how this might look. Um, and that's been a really thrilling part of the process to be able to do that and to be able to support like, oh, I see they need a laugh here. This moment needs to build to this and the laugh has to come here in order for that physical thing that is newly imagined to work, they're gonna need a laugh to that for that to happen. Mm. And so to try to like really craft that and figure that out. And yeah, the show is frozen, but not to me. Like in my brain, I have like eight million more like, oh, I wish I could trim that and add this and you know, but like to Laura's point, the actors have to go, go, go. Yeah. So they're living in it now, which is thrilling. It's interesting, uh, like one of the overall through lines is, is that um, it's, the story, like I said, we flipped it. The story's focusing on the women. It's about like you don't need a partner, you don't need to belong to something else to be whole in in your own right, and or someone else. And I, I wonder, for any of the four of you or all the four of you, uh, the conversations that this may have sparked with your own life partners about uh, about just uh, how how you all identify in your own marriages or relationships. <laughs> 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 Well, mine huh. was just, honey, I, <laughs> <laughs> when are you coming to see the show? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, from the get-go, I'm carrying on with Eric McCormick and, you know, the first 15 minutes of the show in a, in, in a negligee. negligee in a sexy way and some kissing and things so you just have to go well, i hope we're, we're secure in our relationship and uh and my husband handled it well i mean he he, <laughs> he, he told me right before he came to see the show for the first time he was going to boo <laughs> when Eric and I kissed. And i'm waiting for it because then my husband is like that he has that sense of humor boo and like all the people we've been, we've been with would be like hey, you know what <laughs> <laughs> but think he he knew enough he, he actually felt the pace and the rhythm and he was like oh that would have messed you up i never would have you know yeah, yeah so i w i was uh pleased on that yeah. um good your husband didn't boo you that's <laughs> very yeah, that my husband didn't boo yeah but i think well you make a lot of very interesting points about uh marriage and relationships and, and fidelity that, and fidelity and that you know uh there are different ways and arrangements to mm -hmm. be together. Uh, and there are relationships that, where we stay in them because we feel the loyalty and that is the love. And then there are relationships that are sexy and fiery and exciting and, but do those last? And you know, are the strongest marriages at one point, there was a line about, I would venture to say that most successful marriages may not have, uh, the partners may not have been faithful. So it's like, interesting, and because we're all living and trying to figure out how, what is love? What is mm -hmm. monogamy? What is, are we built as, as beings to find one partner and be with them forever? Are we meant to learn as much as we think that we can learn within a relationship and grow and evolve? And then the next natural part of that growth is to be apart and go grow and learn with other people. Who knows? We're, none of us have figured it out. Yeah, I think- And everyone's different. A lot of the conversation in the play about these issues is coming from the male perspective. Um, and it reflects, to me, it reflects a male perspective that was true, I think, in 1923, and is sometimes still true today. And it's, you know, for me, it's how, how are these women navigating their way around this very male-dominated perspective of, of fidelity? Um, I am, my husband's here, and we've been married 22 years in what I think has been a monogamous relationship. <laughs> 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 um, and so, <laughs> he's here something to, to tell you. Of course, yes. Of course. Thank you, honey. It is. I mean, I was really, really, really and truly, and I often have to say this, I was really and truly exploring a genre and a specific moment in time and, and what that conversation was between men and women. Um, and it is not a reflection of my own really lovely marriage with this. With this no, I was not implying that. Yeah, at no, all. I know, no, but, but, but people, you know, that, that's a question to ask if you're going to write a show that addresses these issues. Um, yeah, so I'm very fortunate to have a very supportive partner who does not share the views of the men. In the 
But what is also great is that as the women are rubbing up against these sort of patriarchal constructs, ra- uh, no. constructs around love and marriage, um, and arrangements is that the women have their own ideas and uh, and 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 evolve from them. Yes. Um, and find them find the value in both love and the value in independence and the value in, in sex. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. Yeah, that these women can be outwardly sexual beings and not be ashamed of it. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is yeah. one of my favorite attributes of these characters. They personally yeah. drop the stigma, which is refreshing. Yeah. Thank, yes, I I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um. We have just a few minutes left, so one of my final questions is, I just would love to know, what is the favorite moment in the show that you get to watch somebody else do? Changes. Okay, you guys go for it. I don't know, I have so many. Okay, I'll say my current favorite thing is um, I like watching Lily and Alex <laughs> and all of their canoodles, yeah. <laughs> but in particular, when I'm waiting to come on stage for the first act, uh, we all have these like little door entrances and we have a monitor so that we can see because sometimes we can't hear to cue us, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, and the there's a joke about a place where they have relations. had sexual relations. Okay, okay, that's uh, my favorite joke. <laughs> and, <laughs> And uh, it's strange, and it's turned into like kind of. A it's meal, turned into a three act play. play. It's literally a three act play. Like it's con- it's still going. Yeah, um, it gets longer and longer every night. Yeah, which is a through line for Alex too, because the yeah. statue of the, it's also becoming yeah. like we've started to move on to the next moment, and then we've realized like, he's oh, doing a he's second doing bit, bit in the corner, and we're like, oh, we can't move on because this is actually pertinent information. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, true. that's been my current favorite thing to watch. Yeah, I think my favorite moments are off stage when I'm like about to walk on stage and I'm watching the monitor. Like there's this one moment where Eric and Alex have this face off because they're brothers, you know, so they have that they have that brotherly kind of camaraderie and and bickery fighting relationship. And they do this kind of like face off and it's gotten ridiculous and probably will get more and more ridiculous. And it's I'm laughing out loud backstage watching them do it. It's great. I love being on the steps and I can hear Lily offstage laughing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's uh, so many things like that the first the first moment that Dana was talking about really is and the statue also I'm off stage thank God because I'm the worst I break very easily (laughs) and I get to watch these ad libs that are happening because sometimes the prop doesn't always Mm -hmm. work. And uh, and and they're they're really they're brilliant, and then I also really really enjoy watching Dana get drunk. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. So uh, or recover from being. Yeah. Uh, but there, there's so many, and there's so new things like these. There's these new moments that Lily and Alex are finding that I'm noticing, and uh, I like seeing Eric get mad. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's great. For me, you know, I get to watch the show from the house every night, which is, you know, obviously a total thrill for me. Um, and there's a moment in the second act, which I won't give away, where Lily takes center stage. And it is oh, the, yes. the most, um, it's the most brilliant ensemble comedic acting I could ever imagine. It's like, it, it is this, all six of them are operating on all cylinders at one moment. And it is um, it's thrilling to watch. And it is a moment that could be not thrilling. <laughs> and in the hands of these... And in characters. rehearsal, there were moments where it was not thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. And, um, but in the hands of these six actors, in the way it's currently been imagined, it's just so wonderful. So that remains my favorite moment every night. All right. Well, I'm happy I'm to really hear happy that, that's your Sandy. Favorite <laughs> 
<laughs> um, okay, so like I said, this is a live podcast recording. Um, so I had an, uh, a one-on-one -on -one episode with Laura Bell a while ago, episode 144. Lily was 154. Dana was with some other Beetlejuice cast at 58, and she's about to have her solo episode come out in a week or two here. And one of the final closing questions I ask everyone to wrap up the episodes, and I wrote down your answers previously, I'm just going to ask you real quick, is if you can only see one show for the rest of your life, what would you see? Oh, wow. But you can see it as many times as you want. I said gypsy, didn't I? Uh, no. Ooh. I said that. I said Dana that. said gypsy. Wow. What did I say? You said, well, what would you say now? The cottage. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Well, I get, I don't. What did I say the sound of This music? is exactly what you did last time. You're like, uh, yeah, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> Was it the sound um, of music? No! Oh, what did I say? You said, you said Hamilton, The Carol Burnett Show, and SNL, because you couldn't pick oh. one. Oh, wait, TV show? No, well, that, we're literally having the identical conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And then I well, said, the reason I said Hamilton is because it's so damn dense. You're like, I can't get all the lyrics the first time. Exactly. She literally used the but, word damn dense. I'm, uh, no, did I say damn dense? You then? said, um, well, I didn't write down damn dense, but I listened to it last night. Lily, do you remember what you said? Transcript of the entire conversation. Oh, I do I remember what I said? Yeah. I don't or remember what, what I said. Now? What I think now? maybe I said Carolina Change, but what I would say now is Into the Woods. You said ragtime, but I love Into the Woods. Oh, ragtime. Oh, yes. You said oh, OC yeah, ragtime. Rag time. Yeah, ragtime. Yeah. yeah. Sandy, what would you say? Well, I've never said anything before, so. Um, yeah, this is new, and we're yeah. gonna do a one-on-one. -on -one. We've got to. Oh, okay. All Anytime. Right. Uh, if I had to see a Broadway show, I think it would be The Secret Garden. Oh. Mm. Over and over again, I love that show. Cool. Gypsy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Final answer. Yeah, I did choose Gypsy. You did choose Gypsy. And then I think we debated over which version. Yes. Yes. But yeah, it would be Gypsy or Sunday in the Park with George. Yeah, mm -hmm. you said that, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, where can we find you on the socials other than on the Cottage, uh, Cottage Broadway? Where can we find you on socials? At Laura Bell Bundy and at Women of Tomorrow. I'm at Sandy Reston with a little underscore after the N. I'm at D Steinface. My college roommate made that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm at Lil Coops with a Z. <laughs> <laughs> and I am theater underscore podcast with an underscore uh, theater with an R E. Um, yes, literally, the show is a block away on on Forty Fourth Street, the Cottage on Broadway dot com. This is going to go into the live feed for the theater podcast or the feed for the theater podcast. There's a live bonus episode, and then to wrap this up, the last thing we need to do, we just need to take a big selfie with all of you. So Ooh, let's do this. Okay. And round of applause! Yay. All right. Take a deep breath, make the world a little colorful.